Hello, Tom. Uh, thanks for agreeing to the video call today. No problem, Ben. How's it going? Excellent. It's good. Good. So uh, I wanted to kind of make the most of this time and try and uh, try and generate some content that's going to be useful to people. Um, and useful to myself as well, because this year um, I've always shot weddings uh, as part of a team. Uh, and this year I'm going to be starting, assuming weddings actually start happening again, I'm going to be doing some of my first solo weddings. Um, yeah. So I know there's other people out there probably like me who might be considering doing some solo shooting as a, as a separate package. Um, but yeah, I wanted to just pick your brains and uh, I know you've been doing it a few years and kind of find out uh, some tips that we could all benefit from. Tom and myself met um, through a Facebook group, actually. Uh, we discovered we both live very close to each other. Um, that was a couple of years ago, and it's kind of struck up a bit of a friendship. We both tend to recommend each other if we're busy, because uh, we, we have a fairly similar style. So I've said a little bit, Tom, but can you tell, tell me us a little bit about yourself and a bit how you got into weddings? Yeah, so this, so 2020s will be my fourth year shooting. So I've been shooting since 2017. Um, so I, essentially I got into it um, through my own wedding. So I, I filmed my own wedding really crudely with a tripod and a GoPro. And it's, to look back at it, it's a bit naff, but um, I loved it. I loved having those memories and I've always been shooting video. So sort of a natural thing really progressing into to shooting weddings and so just slowly from from 2017 well early early 2017 sort of building up my equipment my skills knowledge and uh, learning how to do it um, so I got started through filming a friend's wedding for free so I treated it like a, a proper job so I had sort of limited kit limited knowledge really at that time uh, and just turned up and heart and soul into it um, and that's sort of the springboard really for, for my business now is is that that one video so and, and going back I know it, it's it's a few years ago now can you remember what some of the important lessons you remember learning on those early weddings definitely time management that that was 100% the biggest thing you had I had to learn and learn very very quickly uh, and sort of the first wedding I filmed uh, a pay, first paid wedding I filmed that was that was where I learned the hard way really that you manage your time well otherwise you know but it runs away with you and you can pretty quickly lose control um, I remember I got I got to the bride five hours before the ceremony I was so keen I wanted to turn up make sure I had loads of time <laughs> make sure yeah. I did the best job ever you know I turned up and I was getting all my kit ready you know and double checking it triple checking it and but then I spent all morning doing bride prep and a bit of groom prep as well and I sort of got carried away in that I was so engrossed in getting these lovely shots of yeah. bride and groom ready the ceremony was although well, it was a five hours away in the morning it started to come around so so quickly and I just remember uh, being there for the bride putting on a dress getting some shots and mum coming in the reveal to the bridesmaids and stuff and then she was ready and, and I was like, oh, fantastic. And then it clicked. I was like, it's ceremony now. <laughs> Jesus, what, what am I going to do? Like, <laughs> the venue I shot at, Tissington Hall, um, Derbyshire, they, she was getting ready in the hall and getting married at the church, which was a, you know, a two or three minute walk from the hall. Yeah. So I had was tops. I had three minutes on the bride walking out that hall to the church. So I just remember grabbing all my gear. I was scrambling down the road and I was probably about 30 steps ahead of the bride and all a you know, bridal party. And I had to get up the path to the church, get the vicar mic up, get the groom mic up, get a tripod set up with a safety camera on it. You know, it was, it was the most stressed I think I've ever been in my life. That was probably the, the single biggest learning point I've ever had past filming weddings is manage your time or you're going to fall on your ass oh yeah I, I agree i think the first thinking back to the weddings i did even though i wasn't shooting on my own the the first few you learn so much it, it's incredible and you learn quickly uh, mm -hmm. I, I know videographers now who don't do weddings who work for video agencies and 
when I spoke to them and, and you tell them that you shoot weddings, sometimes they think you're crazy because of the pressure, it's a one-time event, and it's definitely like baptism by fire. You, you <laughs> burn quickly or you, you fail and you never want to do it again. Yeah. So um, I do think if you get through those early ones, it's like, it's so valuable. Yeah, um, 100%. <clears throat> so um, moving on to the whole uh, solo shooting theme, um, before we start about how you approach your day, um, I just wanted to check, because all around the country, around the world, um, it, things are a bit different. And what are your deliverables? What are you actually looking to get for the bride and groom? Because that would make a big difference, I suppose, to, to your approach. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I always, another, another learning point is shoot for the edits. So know what you're delivering to your client and what, you know, make sure you know what they've bought to what you've offered them. Um, so you're not, you know, you could, you could turn up and shoot all day, everything that happens, but if you're not going to be delivering that to the client, you're wasting your time and you're putting undue pressure on yourself. So, um, my package is quite straightforward, single packages, um, a highlight video, the ceremony in full, speech in full, first dance in full. Um, I have a few little additional extras, but that's sort of like the core package. So that's good. That's great. Um, so let's start at the beginning of the day. Uh, bride preparation. Um, what is your typical routine? Um, how much in terms of how many hours do you film that for? And uh, what's your general approach, really? Yeah, normally... I say a safe bet is turn up a couple of hours before, depending on the setup of the day. Um, I think the main issue with solo shooting is multi-location weddings. So if the bride's getting ready at home, you know, a home, the church is somewhere, reception venue somewhere, or if you've got to nip out and get the groom. So I think the from the moment I get with the get to the bride in the morning up until after the ceremony, probably the the hardest few hours I find in the day and that I work because I'm splitting myself of stuff that's happening. So um, a safe bet is normally two, two and a half hours before. Uh, and in sort of my mind, I want a good sort of core group of shots of the bride uh, and the bridal party, some details. So I've got enough for that highlight video. Um, and if they've arranged for any extras, making sure I get those nice shots. Um, you sort of, I think you get into a pattern, you know, when you turn up, you see, you know, when you've been to so many weddings, you know, at what stage they're at and what's going to be coming up. So if the bride sat there, she's got no makeup on her face, her hair's a mess, you're not grabbing shots of that because no one's going to appreciate that at the end of the day. Yeah. But if they're, you know, they've, they've, it's a good moment to go up, grab a couple of shots of the dress. I don't tend to overdo it with the detail in terms of like items and dresses and shoes and stuff. I'll get one or two shots uh, and of the flowers too. But because I've got, you know, a real concentrated package of sort of, it's people uh, rather than showing them all the items on the day. I want to show memories of their family and, and themselves. So I don't go to town with too much detail um, in terms of the, the, what they're wearing and what, you know, what they've yeah. got. No, no, that, that's, that's really interesting. And do you, you mentioned at the beginning about groom prep and do you, is that something you would try and discourage them away from, especially if it's at a different location or, if you do do it, do you do that before bride prep? Because you mentioned that obviously at the beginning, sometimes the bride, the early stages of bride prep, their hair might not be right. They might not be in a stage where they want you to film yet. So what do you do if somebody asks for groom prep? That the, Filming, I do film groom prep as well as bride. If, if they're within sort of a 10 minute drive of wherever the bride's getting ready, uh, I don't know whether it's foolish of me to offer this, but I, I do it because, you know, I want to get the best shots I can from in the morning and deliver both sides, you know, bride and groom. Um, so it depends on the locations. Uh, I've done it plenty of times where the bride's getting ready at her mum and dad's house and the groom's getting ready at his mum and dad's house and they're sort of 10, 15 minutes apart. So mm. sometimes you know, in, in sort of two, two and a half hours, there can be quite a bit of a lull in the, in the prep at the bride's house. You know, you're not constantly filming for two hours, two and a half hours of, you know, just makeup, hair, because you just be absolutely overrun with it. So you can slip out for half an hour to go visit the groom, and it's really easy when you turn up. It's, it's probably the most awkward part of the day because the grooms are never normally willing victims and being filmed, you know, especially yeah. when it's, it's you, like, two blokes, and you're trying to get shots of them. You know, that's normally the most challenging bit of the day is trying to get them to relax and feel natural yeah. when filmed in their own house or whatever. But... 
it's also probably the quickest and easiest because it's you know tie shirt you know put the jacket on you're sorted so um you know you can come away with some really lovely stuff and um, one thing that even as a, as a team i sometimes struggle with is if during the bride prep uh, things are running a little bit late um i imagine this is even more so if you're a solo shooter so i really wanted to ask you about this um one important thing i like to capture is the father seeing the bride for the first time but there's a lot of weddings i've been at where things are running behind schedule and in the back of my mind i'm thinking i need to be going to the church now because you don't know about parking you need to park you need to get your camera set up on tripods set up audio um how do you handle that situation if things are running a bit late yeah i think the the steps i take for that is try and get in there before it starts to get too late so i if i was to see how the prep's going in the morning if everything's running like cot work you know people are in and out the make a party's chair really quickly and you know they they keep reminding time checking themselves you know are you putting your dress on are you doing this you know you're in good hands with them but if they're too laid back they're chilled you i, I have to sort of try and jump in a bit and i start a, a quite useful prompt i say to the bride is are you still getting in your dress for this time you know or sh- what time are you getting in your dress I, I i ask that question quite a lot um and it's yeah. a question i ask at the meetings as well i always try to say to them what time are you getting in your dress? Um, and then try and influence and positively influence and just sort of say, look, the early, I know it's not going to be the most comfortable of gowns, but you paid a lot of money for it. You want to be in it and make the most of it. So the earlier you can get into it, the more shots I can get for you and make sure that I'm fully set up later on in the day, especially the ceremony. So if it's not too much an issue for you, if you're going to put your dress on at half 12, can we make it? quarter past 12, 12 o'clock, you know, give you time to have touch-ups, give you time to, you know, have some photos as well because the photographer will be there and you can enjoy having it on instead of having to slip it on and immediately be chucked in a car and be dropped off at the church. You know? ah. so try and influence before before I get to the point where it's running late. Um, yeah. And having done all of that, if they're still running late and after all the prompts and I'm saying, you know, where's your dad? So a problem I come across quite a lot is where's the dad? You know, he disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like she's in a dress ready you're behind schedule but the dad is nowhere to be seen so you're like for god's sake where's dad and you you know and the key is not to be the one out looking for him because you don't want to be out looking for him you turn up and you miss it so I, you know task people as well task bridesmaids go find dad or you know whoever so you're you can just stay glued to the bride so you don't miss whatever happens brides and especially mothers of brides i find will try and influence you and try and sort of guilt you to a degree making sure that you know oh come on you know it's just this it's just five more minutes come on just wait just wait but it, you'll regret it a thousand times over when you turn up at the church and the vicar doesn't want to know doesn't care that you're not set up and you especially churches because oh my god you know some other church you turn up to when there's no lighting when there's no place to stand and stuff if you're not there nice and early your life's just going to be hell so just be firm and just say yeah. this is going to happen oh that's yeah no that makes a lot of sense it, it really does and i think standing your ground when you need to because as well as that as well as that you, you've been asked for them at the beginning but there is a point where you know um as much as they might want you to stay for that um father daughter moment it's like you have a contract to fulfill and if you stay for that moment they might be happy in that minute of time but i suppose later if if the ceremony is not there and you've promised a full ceremony i suppose you know you, you've got to keep to your contract and protect yourself as well so mm. yeah that's that's really good advice I would, I'd definitely do that um once you get there um there's a couple of questions here so w- first of all what gear do you take into we're going to go with a church uh wedding here because that in my mind that's the hardest situation you're going to get a multi-location wedding um know a lot of these problems we're going to talk about in this interview probably won't be the same if, if you're in one location but um you're there you you're in a hurry you've got to set up quickly what gear are you taking and what's your routine as soon as you get to the church so i this this is the next sort of other than timekeeping the next most important tip i'd say is uh, travel light that take with you as little kit as you need to film that service um so 
I have a, a hard roller case uh, that I have my sort of, I like to say expensive kit in. So all the cameras, lenses, audio in a sort of hard hard box, like a pelly case type thing on, got a monopod with a camera on it. Uh, so, it, so quite often you'll turn up, something's going on. You don't want all your stuff packed away in, in your, so I always leave uh, my main A cam out, uh, whatever I'm doing. So if I'm taking in the monopod, I'll just have it on the top. And then if you spot something nice, you're in a position to grab it straight away. Yeah. I shoot with three cameras. Um, so I'll have, I'll try and always get an angle from the front, uh, which I would man myself. Uh, so you can get the nice walking up the aisle shot. You can be in a position where, you know, the majority of the actions up, up, up front. So you want to make sure that you can be versatile and get different angles. You're in the control off um, at the front. Uh, and then really the, the last two cameras are dictated by the layout. So, um, you know, your different configurations of churches, some have the doors directly at the back of the aisle. So you can't put tripod direct center at the, you know, the bottom of the aisle because, you know, they've got to walk up. So um, yeah. what I do is put it at a slight angle. So I'll put it as close to the pews as possible, but still looking up the center of the aisle if I can. Uh, so I always make sure I've got that sort of safety, big wide at the back. Um, and then the second angle really is is sort of try and be a bit creative. Where can I stick it, you know, um, that's not in the way, isn't going to get knocked over. Yeah. And will be a really nice angle. So, yeah, oh, that all makes sense. That That's that's really useful. And then what, what I imagine, it, if you do the same as me, Tom, do you do a bit of a highlights during the signing before they then leave the church? Yeah, so I'll, um, what I tend to do then, so as soon as uh, the vicar or registrar says, right, we're now going to pause, we're going to sign the register, you know, you can switch your cameras off and you can have a bit of a breather uh, because sort of the pressure's off. But what I tend to do is leave an audio source recording so I get some nice background audio uh, if, they've, if they've got any sort of musicians or just sort of ambient noise. And then I'll grab some sort of, uh, you know, 10 or so shots of bits and bobs going on. So uh, the, the mock signing, um, guests and stuff like that. So I can piece together sort of almost like a little intermission type thing where it's sort of, you know, the, this, it, it captures some nice bits, but it's not recorded in full. And then yeah. the ceremony I'll, I'll deliver in full. So when they sort of announce the couple, they come down the aisle. Um, I'll film that from a couple of angles uh, with the audio as well. Um, and so you're not having to constantly record for, for the entire ceremony. You can have a breather. And, and another sort of top tip as well, really, is start packing away kit. If you get uh, that down when the sign in the register, start packing kit away. You know, the camera you're not going to be using, the tripod you're not going to be using, get that packed away because it's that 30, 30 seconds a minute that you'll need later on when they suddenly start throwing confetti. You'll be grateful that you've packed stuff away and you've not got to worry about it when they start moving on to the venue or whatever they're doing outside. That's a, that's a brilliant tip actually, because that was going to be my, my next question. I know when I have a second shooter, I'm normally, um, I get my second shooter to pack up because I'm always worried. Sometimes the couple leave the church and it's straight into the confetti. And I'm thinking the people from the church, they just want to lock up and go home and you don't want them locking all your gear in there. So yeah. that's a brilliant tip that is really helpful. Use that signing time to start getting stuff ready so you can make a swift exit ready for the confetti. Brilliant. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> um, okay. I'll just have a quick look at my questions. Um, oh, the have confetti shot. One, one second. Mate. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> you mentioned the oh, confetti gosh. shot. Oh yeah, me too. I'm a, a little cider during the lockdown. <laughs> um, yeah, the confetti shot. How do you go about doing that? I know um, sometimes confetti shot is where some people might consider bringing out the gimbal, you know, going to town a bit. What do you do as a, as a solo shooter during that shot? I've, again, with the, with the mantra, keep it simple. Uh, I've got a gimbal when I've had one. Uh, pretty much since I've started uh, filming weddings, but probably I, I don't think I got it out once the whole of last season uh, because it's it's one extra thing to be faffing around with and you know and spending time on setting up. And you can imagine after the ceremony's finished, 
everyone's streaming outside, everyone's getting set up, the photographer's shouting, can we have two lines? Can we have everybody handing out confessing? You're there trying to balance a gimbal. You know, it's not quite balanced how you want it to be and you're, you're twisting dials, or you're getting it set up and then suddenly you just hear everyone cheering and hollering and then you've missed it. Um, so I shoot on the GH5, which has got IBIS uh, and stabilization built in. So if you're shooting 60 frames a second, and you're slowing it right down uh, in post, you can you can definitely get away with walking backwards if you're smooth enough with the the ibis and uh, you know slowing it down. So I've I quite frequently what well, what well, I do every single time that this last season handheld and just walk backwards with the photographer if it's sort of a tunnel yeah. or if it's straightforward and just a group throwing it over and then nothing to yeah. So I try and go handheld through probably 95% of the day other than uh, ceremony and speeches really. Yeah, that, that, um, the Panasonic Ibis really is a, the American, I suppose Americans will say a game changer. Um, yeah. I found the same. It's like, uh, it, it really is meant we don't need the monopod or the tripod. Absolutely love it. So yeah, no, that's great. I think the gimbal, you, yeah, like you say, keep things simple. Um, so you've, you've shot your, um, you've shot your confetti and now we're going on to the, uh, reception. Um, it's normally onto couple shots straight away. And so I imagine, I'm, I'm going to assume you use the IBIS still, do you still go handheld for couple shots? Or? Yeah, yeah, totally handheld. Yeah. Yeah. And then the next the next difference, I suppose, um, from shooting as a team, like I am at the moment, my next question would be, there's been a bit of a trend lately, I've found. Um, whereas in the past, in England, it would always be the case that you'd have, um, at the beginning of the wedding breakfast, which is the big meal everyone has, um, you, well, you would have your whole meal, and then at the very end, you would have the speeches. But the last year or two, everyone's shaking things up a bit, and quite often now, you'll either get the speeches at the beginning or you'll get them kind of scattered through the different courses of the meal. So my next <laughs> yeah. question to you, Tom, is, as a solo shooter, you're doing your couple shots, which we all know are crucial. The couple shots are like the, the, you know, the money shots for the whole day. So we want to do a good job. But now you're going from that and it's almost straight away going into wedding breakfast with speeches at the beginning. Um, what's your approach? So, again, it's knowing what you need for the edit. So I know in my mind, in a highlight video, I've probably realistically got, I'll need 10 really decent shots of a couple. So I can have a couple at the beginning um, and a segment sort of towards the end. I mean, I've got, you know, I have my own way of editing, my own template in my mind. So I know what I need. So I, I go out with that intention then. I need 10 really, really good shots um, that I know I'm going to be able to use and then maybe a couple of safety ones. So you're just getting in angles. Um, but then the key is just to know when to cut your losses. You know, if, if you've got that time pressure or if you've got to go set up for speeches, mm. then it's sort of two scenarios, really. You either do it before you go out with a couple. So, you know, once you've got the, you know, if you're at the venue, you've done the confetti, you've done a few nice drink shots, you've, got some nice stuff with the family then you know to come away and get set up early you know there's no harm in having the kit set up ready you know you don't have to have it recording we'll just have it sat ready to go or if that's possible the day's moving too fast for you you know you stuff's happening quicker than what you can keep up with and you've just got to roll with it then you've got to start cutting some stuff short so if you're with the couple once you've got in your mind what you need you know you've reviewed it in camera and you've gone, yeah, this is what I need, fantastic. Then you just cut your losses. If the photographer's planning another 10, 15 minutes with him, to take him to this other location, wants to do this with him, you just wave goodbye and say, guys, I've got what I need. Uh, you know, I'm sure Dave is going to get some really nice photos, but in terms of your video, I've got some amazing stuff. So I'm going to excuse myself and go set off the speeches. And, you know, they won't quibble. They won't. I've never known a couple of me to stay. Get more shots of us, please. Um, so it's just being confident in your shooting and knowing once you've got enough for what you're giving to them, then, you know, you can step away and focus on the important stuff like getting set up. And so you're not being 
caught off guard with the speeches later on because it's happened to me before you know again with, with that first paid wedding I shot I did the same then you know you it's there was a beautiful drinks reception getting plenty of shots of the family and getting some lovely stuff of kids running around playing and all this but then suddenly you hear that ladies and gentlemen if you want to come to the marquee <laughs> the the bride and groom will be entering and we're straight into speeches and you're like oh god you know I'm not set up and you're like again and and speeches can be you know one of the more precarious things in that if you're contending with a DJ soundboard or sort of the, the venue's in-house mic system, trying to circumnavigate that and get some really decent audio, can, it can be a sort of 10-minute job making sure that it all sounds good, that it's, you know, yeah. you know, horrendous echo and stuff like that. So you want to give yourself plenty of time so when they, the speeches start, you're not caught off guard and you're not coming away with terrible audio because you're not giving yourself enough time to prepare for it. You, you're right there, audio is absolutely key in it. Um, to address the, the earlier thing you said as well about knowing when you've got enough footage, uh, I think that's a great point and I think it takes great discipline. I know myself sometimes, uh, I have a, what would probably be classed as a fear of missing out. It's so hard when, especially if like the lighting conditions are perfect, the backdrop, and it's like a fear of missing out. Oh, I can't go now. I could get so many more nice shots. Or just stay. But I suppose it's just you've got to be strong with yourself and say, I've got enough. If you've been doing it a while, you know how many shots you need. And, and you've just got to be professional, like you say, and say, look, I've got as many shots as I need to give you a good service. I now need to go and set up for the speeches. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of, in terms of audio, you said about um, getting a, a feed of the house audio. Um, is that what you try and do every time? Do you sometimes adapt your technique? What do you do on like an ideal speeches session versus one where you are a little bit under pressure? Do you change things or do you, you always keep it the same? Yeah, I try and prioritize my audio sources and, and, and you've, got, you've got to sort of, you, you see how much time you've got and what you realistically can do in that time uh, versus what you're going to get out of it. So. Uh, if I've got plenty of time, so for, for me, plenty of time is, you know, 15, 20 minutes, you know, I'm happy. If I can get that, that's, you know, for a solo shooter, that's a massive amount of time to get set up for something because it's a real luxury uh, when you're <laughs> on to from yourself. But so if if we're dealing with a venue that's got like a, their own sort of uh, in, uh, in-house mic system, like a wireless system, um, you know, what I typically do is... Uh, I've got Tascam, um, uh, Sony, ta- uh, sorry, Sony uh, TX650s that oh, yeah. I, uh, strap onto the um, microphone itself. Um, I'll try and plug into the board. So I'll take feeds out of there, sometimes multiple feeds if I can. There's uh, safeties, so whatever jacks you can get out of it. Um, quite a nice backup as well is draping a, a lav mic over one of the speakers. Um, yeah. That's bailed me out on quite a few occasions, you know, when everything else has gone wrong. So I sort of I go with the the ethos of get as many mics on there as I can, uh, and one of them is going to be fantastic, you know, if you do it right. So you sort of, you know, you've got to again, as I say it again, you've got to, you know, be firm, cut your losses. You can't sit there for 15, 20 minutes trying to, you know, dial in and make sure that the onboard uh, audio from the mic systems coming out perfect if it doesn't work in the first five minutes cut your losses move to the next source you know get get labs out put them over speakers get them on the microphone make yeah. sure that everyone else is mic'd up uh, you know on their jackets or dresses or whatever because you know you'll know as well as me Ben when people you know gets handed to mother of the bride or whatever and she's like I don't need this microphone everyone can hear me she puts it down <laughs> and if you've focused all your mics on that uh, microphone system you've got no really decent source of audio because you know she's put the mic down so it's just backups for backups really is what I go for and yeah oh definitely and I I think you've mentioned audio a lot there and I I I found the same so audio is so important you I sometimes find if, if you've got a camera angle that's not perfect it's not as bad as having no audio you you need mm-hmm. the backups on top of backups like you say don't you so uh, I, I like the idea of kind of prioritizing and 
just putting as many as you can. I think that's a great approach, as many as you yeah. can, isn't it? So, uh, so uh, that's covered most of the day. After that, I normally feel myself things are kind of getting quite a bit easier after speech, as the pressure's off a bit. Uh, are there any tips you've got? Um, if you think about everything that happens after the speeches, any tips regarding that, or or you just um, try and get a bit of everything? What's your approach there? Yeah, you. I like you say, like you said, it, it's there's a lot of dead time between the, sp the speeches ending and then you know the evening getting kick started with evening guests arriving and the first dance. You can sometimes have like a three or four hour lull of you know, you've got nothing to film or what's happening is just people uh, milling around and, you know, having the odd drink and stuff. You've already got shots of that earlier in the day. So again, a, a tip is just don't shoot for the sake of it because the stuff you'll come away with will be naff. You won't use it. You'll have to sift through it in the edit and you'll be cursing yourself. Why have I done this to myself? You know, I'm yeah. taking up, I'm taking up my time. I don't need to do this. So just know, right. I've got everything before speeches now is done. The next thing in my in my mind now, I'm going to need some shots of some evening guests, you know, arriving, having some drinks, having a bit of fun, some dancing, and then the first dance and the cake. So everything else, you don't really need to be going crazy and shooting because if it's not part of your the videos you're delivering, you don't need to be shooting it. And unless something spectacular is going on or something really really nice, but just know when to call you know call it quits and say right, I'm not filming now for the next couple of hours because nothing's really going to be going on. So what I tend to do is take my laptop, um, I'll start backing up footage, I'll start syncing up the ceremony, and if I've done the speeches, try and sync them up as well. So it's sort of really maximising the day as much as possible. So you're not sort of sat twiddling your thumbs for four hours uh, doing nothing because, you know, there's nothing to shoot. I'll use that time effectively and start editing. You know, I'll start uh, trimming clips and stuff and importing it and, uh, just maximize the time so then when you, you'll just thank yourself the next day or in a, a few weeks time when you sit down and start editing you'll be like thank god i did that ceremony or thank god i did this because you know it just takes a lot of pressure off in the edit yeah oh that, that that's great that that's all great advice um well i suppose that we, we've covered the whole day so what i was thinking of doing now tom if it's all right is just going to a few general questions um probably based on more general videography um for, for your company and your approach so i wondered about your approach towards gear like i know you've mentioned some of the cameras you use but maybe just a, a quick go kind of a quick summary of all the gear that you use on the day uh and how it helps you as a solo shooter yeah so i mentioned earlier so i shoot on the gh5 um so i'll shoot handheld most of the day uh, sort of lens wise, um, probably 80% of the day I'll have um, the uh, Noticon 42.5mm, uh, so uh, 85 equivalent on all day, uh, really nice lens. Um, and then I sort of vary between 25mm, uh, 1.7, um, I'll vary you know, with a got the 15mm, 1.7 as well. So it's sort of a bit of a variety that I'll have in my bag. Yeah. But, one camera so i'll just uh, i won't have some videographers i have a second camera on the belt or whatever but i'll just i swap lenses if i need to i'm not too fussed about being able to grab a second camera quickly because i'm it's not it's not imperative really uh, and you just weigh yourself down more kit um yeah. then sort of safety cams now so in the last few weeks um so i've got a second gh5 um and then a gh5s uh, that i'll have for ceremony speeches so i'll get them out just for those moments really um and then audio wise so i've got um task cams um the uh i've got the sony tx 650s um i've got some backup zoom h1s as well um and so it's just yeah but certainly audio wise it's just having plenty of options so when you get to some speeches where you've got like six or seven people talking you've got a kit to, to stick it on everybody um but yeah so i try and travel as light as possible so you're not you know there, there's some videographers that will use monitors on on uh monopods and stuff they'll have it on top of the cameras they'll have sort of wireless uh systems they'll have i just think 
whatever takes away as much complication as possible is the best thing because you don't want to be in a pressure situation before a ceremony where you've only got 10 minutes to get set up for the whole thing and you're pulling out a big, you know, uh, you've got uh, your Sennheiser wireless packs and you've got, uh, you know, all the, you know, your gimbal out. It, it's just too much. If you're shooting solo, you yeah. don't always have the luxury of having all those Gucci little bits that, you know, could, you know, up the production level slightly, but could also have the biggest hindrance when it all goes wrong because you've been faffing around trying to get your frequency right with your wireless kit and it's interfering and stuff. You like just stick the recorders on them, get your cameras and lenses running, and just crack on. Because you, well, you know, both those recorders, you mentioned that the, the Sony and the Tascam, I use them as well, and they're, they're so good, aren't they? I, I know some people will say, oh, it's good to monitor levels, but I kind of think you. Have you got time to monitor levels? If you're current, you're monitoring mm. a camera as well. You're thinking of multiple cameras, and I don't know about you, but I found that these Tascams and these Sonys are so good on auto levels. I've never listened to the audio and thought, "Oh, it peaked." It, it, mm. I mean, the Tascams have the dual levels, don't they? So if it yeah. never has peaked, I've never had to use those dual. You know, the second backup file because the first one yeah. is so good. Okay, well, another question. I'm getting near the end of it now. Um, what would you say has been your biggest struggle uh, being a solo shooter uh, and how have you coped with it? Um, probably the biggest struggle is, is every day of the week that that gap between uh, leaving the bride and getting to the ceremony, that's 100% is the most stressful part of my day. It's the, day that, that the part of the day that can go wrong the most, you know, if you time it wrong. So again, I think we've covered it quite a lot, but it's just that uh, making sure that you're giving yourself enough time to get to the ceremony and get set up. That is hands down. That's when it's probably the only time of the day where I think to myself, oh, I really love a second shooter here to help me. <laughs> the only time, every other part of the day, I'm fine and yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's absolutely okay. So uh, final question uh, before we round things up was uh, you've been doing it a few years now and I know we're constantly learning like you said at the beginning um have you got any plans or changes um in the coming season I know the coming season's been disrupted quite a lot with everything going on but anything anything different you're looking to do in the future I think I think at each wedding I try and do something a tiny bit different uh you know try and uh keep it fresh so it doesn't turn into sort of too much of a um, production line of weddings so when you you know week in week out you're just doing exactly the same thing so I try you know experiment with a different angle uh, you know try and um, that, that's the main thing really is sort of once you're comfortable with your timings and stuff that's when you can start to really be artistic and um, experiment with new things and stuff and you know there's there's certainly, you know, that there's the room for me to, for the gimbal. You know, I, I ruled it out early last season. I didn't get it out. But, you know, like for first dance and stuff, I might try and start getting that out again when you've got the time. And, uh, you know, there's, there's all little things you can do to try and sort of, um, you know, spice up the day, so to speak. <laughs> Different. Um, but ultimately, you've got to remember that, you know, the couple have watched the, the work on your website. That's what they love. And you've got to deliver, you know, some, some really nice videos from me. You don't want to be in a position where you change up stuff too much because, you know, that's the reason they've booked you is because they like what they see. Uh, but there's always room for, you know, um, small changes, certainly with the edit style, certainly with, you know, uh, the, the sort of angles you shoot from and stuff. So, yeah, it's just I've got no sort of big plan. Certainly not, you know, I've, I've always toyed with the idea of, finding a second shooter maybe but I've, I've no immediate plans because I'm comfortable in my workflow I'm comfortable how I structure my days um so you know it's just making sure that you're keeping yourself excited with your work and that you're interested in what you're doing so you're not sort of becoming complacent and bored you want to make sure you're doing the best you can for each of your couples really yeah I think that's a great point I think I think when you've been doing weddings a year, getting that balance of um, providing what they've booked you for, but still keeping yourself excited and interested, that's an important balance to strike. Um, so, yeah, 
Well, it, it's been brilliant chatting with you, Tom. Uh, I thank you so much because uh, uh, there's been so many tips in there. As I mentioned at the beginning, I, I think I did. Um, I normally work as part of a team, but I am starting to to do some solo weddings this year. So it's been great to hear all, from all your experience, um, all your tips, and um, feeling a lot more prepared for it now. And hopefully if there's other people watching this video, wherever they may, may be in the world, uh, you've picked up a lot from Tom and, um, and it will help you prepare for doing it on your own. I, I think one big benefit, part of the reason I'm, I'm looking to do it, if I'm completely honest, is because you're not having to pay a second shooter. And if there are weddings, when you've been doing it for a while, that you, you feel confident enough now that you could take them on on your own, you can come in at lower price and it keeps you competitive against um, other people in your local market. Um, so that's been great. Uh, my final question to you, Tom, is just where can people find out if they want to see your work, if they want to... Um, just see what you're producing, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Where's the best place to find that? Best place is the website. So um, my company is Marvelous Videography. The website is marvelousvideo.com. Um, I've got Instagram, Facebook. Uh, probably like a lot of people in the industry, it's always difficult to keep it up to date because you're busy editing and stuff. But yeah, I've got uh, my blog on there, which I sort of periodically update. So yeah, just uh, check me out and um, my emails are there if anyone wants to drop me a message or get in touch. Brilliant. And if anybody does has, have any questions, Tom, are you happy for them to post them in the comments, whether it's wherever this video ends up? Whether yeah, it's yeah, YouTube. absolutely. Yeah, drop them below and um, see what we can do. Super. Well, thanks very much. And uh, we'll see you very soon on our next video. Thanks, Tom. Bye. Yeah, cool. Thanks a lot, mate.